This module explores the concepts of indicators and methods for measuring vegetation and plant communities. These are important concepts to understand for designing and implementing monitoring programs and for using and interpreting monitoring data. In order to understand the importance of indicators and methods, it's necessary to first know about ecosystem attributes. Simply put, an ecosystem attribute is a complex variable that represents the status of a suite of related ecological properties like species composition and processes like water and nutrient cycling that are essential to ecosystem function. Ecosystem attributes capture the components and dynamics that define an aspect of an ecosystem. For example, growth and reproduction of vegetation in a rangeland is tied to the existing plant community on a site interactions from insects like pollinators and wildlife and influences from soils and available water. The three attributes that generally define ecosystem health, particularly in rangelands, include biotic integrity, soil and site stability, and hydrologic function. In many cases, management is focused on maintaining or enhancing ecosystem attributes. However, because of their complex nature, ecosystem attributes can be very challenging to completely describe and difficult to measure. Successful monitoring programs are focused on measurements that are sensitive to changes in key ecosystem attributes. For this to happen, we must be able to identify what those important indicators are and determine how to interpret changes in the indicator values over time. To do this effectively, we need to understand how management and other disturbances, such as drought, affect the land. Conceptual ecosystem models are helpful for organizing this knowledge and information so that it can be applied to selecting and interpreting indicators. While not statistical or predictive, conceptual models should contain enough detail to document the known or hypothesized impacts of management and other disturbances on plant communities and soils. Conceptual models can also highlight knowledge gaps in its ecosystem structure and function. Any ecological system can be described using a number of different conceptual models. One model may emphasize the events or processes of a system and their interactions, while another may focus on the components themselves and how the processes or stressors cause changes in the system. Conceptual models can also be created at different scales to describe the same system. Sometimes, several different types of models describing the same ecosystem or models at different scales can be helpful in developing monitoring programs. One type of conceptual model is the control model. Control models describe our best knowledge about how an ecosystem is organized and how it functions and how it responds to different ecosystem drivers. Control models describe the predominant drivers, stressors, and events of a system and how they interact. Control models may be very general for broadly defined ecosystems, like this model that describes the dynamics of terrestrial dryland ecosystems, or they can be much more specific for narrowly defined ecosystems. Control models focus more on the overall influence and interaction of the ecosystem drivers than on the components of the ecosystem. Components can be considered discrete elements relative to the influence of drivers and stressors. When this is the case, the components of the system can be represented as a series of interrelated states that are linked by transitions defined by one or more drivers. This state and transition approach to modeling clearly illustrates possible outcomes of natural or human-caused processes and events. State and transition models are particularly useful for developing monitoring programs because of their management-oriented focus on the causes of change in an ecosystem. State and transition models are commonly used to illustrate possible changes in terrestrial plant communities and soil properties and their interactions. They can be used to help decide which areas to monitor based on where change is most likely to occur. They can also be used to help decide, also be used to help decide what to monitor because they often provide information on soil and vegetation changes 
that are likely to precede a change in state. States are distinguished by transitions, which may be relatively irreversible, reflecting a significant increase in energy required to shift back to the previous state. State and transition models generally include at least two states and one or more plant communities within each state. Plant communities within a state are similar in their species compositions. Plant communities are also similar in their capacity to limit soil loss, cycle water, and produce vegetation biomass. Changes among plant communities within states are considered to be reversible through simple changes in management, like grazing, or by fluctuating climatic conditions. The state and transition model diagrams show possible transitions between states. The diagrams also illustrate the factors that increase the probability that changes will occur. Transitions between states are reversible only through generally costly, intensive practices like shrub removal or soil modification. Regardless of the form of conceptual model you use, however, a good conceptual model will help you define what aspects of an ecological attribute may be important to measure for monitoring. Applying conceptual models to monitoring program design helps define ecological potential, benchmarks, or reference condition, and make predictions about possible future change of different types of land units in a landscape. This allows monitoring plot selection to be based on objectives and the ecological processes involved in land change. Designing a monitoring program within a conceptual model framework helps specify the ecosystem attributes to be monitored and other details that may vary among states and ecological site. For example, if impacts of grazing management is an objective of monitoring on a breaks ecological site, such as shown in the model here, the state and transition model uh, above provides several important pieces of information for selecting indicators of potential transitions between the states. First, the model predicts that competition for water and resources leads to a transition between the mixed grass savanna and the woody or succulent dominated state and that this competition is influenced by grazing intensity, by fire frequency, and by precipitation. Second, the transition between the states is characterized by changes in bare ground and cover of litter and perennial grasses. This information can help you determine what aspects of the ecosystem to measure and how to interpret changes in those measurements. Armed with this information, we can now formally define our monitoring indicators. An indicator is something that can be observed or measured that is correlated with an ecosystem attribute or process that's too difficult, inconvenient, or expensive to measure directly. Sometimes direct measurements of an ecosystem process and, or property are impossible. Other times it's simply too expensive. For example, the amount of bare ground on a plot and its arrangement can be an indicator of the potential for soil erosion and soil nutrient loss, decreased water infiltration and species invasion, all things that are difficult to measure directly. When selecting indicators, it's important to think carefully about what you need to learn from your monitoring program, compatibility with other monitoring programs, and how precise the data needs to be. Conceptual models, policies, and regulations are good places to look for what are appropriate indicators for a monitoring program. So, what makes a good indicator for a study or for monitoring? Here's a list of desirable traits for indicators. While it may not always be possible to cover all these traits for your indicators, you should give priority to indicators that meet as many of these traits as possible. Useful and informative indicators have the following traits. They're relevant to ecosystem structure or function. Indicators must relate in a known way to the structure or function of an ecosystem of interest. Documentation through a conceptual model is one way to do this. Indicators also need to be usable, meaning that there's sufficient documentation to select appropriate methods and calculate the indicators uh, from measurements or observations that you make. They also need to be cost-effective. 
the cost of collecting an indicator needs to be low or lower than that from other competing indicators. They also need to have a known cause and effect relationship. That means that there's a clear understanding of how changes in an ecosystem attribute will result in changes to the indicator. Going along with that, they need to have a high signal to noise ratio, which means that changes in indicator values are primarily related to the intended ecosystem attribute and not to natural variability or other sources of, of noise. They need to have established quality assurance and quality control procedures. They also need to be anticipatory. This means that the indicator provides an early warning of widespread ecosystem changes. The historical record is also important, which means that information on the indicator has been collected over a period of time such that a reference set of data exists to help you interpret the data on the indicator. Indicators that are retrospective or have the potential to be retrospective are also important. This means that the indicator provides information about historic conditions like tree rings or over extended period of time like in soil carbon or indicators that can be applied to previously collected data like remotely sensed imagery. It's important to have indicators that provide you with new information. That means that the indicator provides information to your study or your monitoring that you're not already getting with other indicators. Minimal impact on the environment is also important. This means that collection of information for measuring the indicator causes the least amount of disturbance to the environment as possible. Indicators that are used by other monitoring programs should also be a priority. And indicators that are easy to understand and explain are always a good idea. Indicators that are intuitive and likely to be uh, are likely to be more effective at informing and influencing management decisions. And finally, indicators that are applicable to policy and management. These are indicators that relate to aspects of an ecosystem that can be managed or that are tied to management policies. For local monitoring needs, indicators can be selected for each monitoring or assessment project individually. However, when you're monitoring at regional or national scales, or where monitoring data may be used to address multiple resource objectives, or different data sets need to be combined together, we can divide indicators into two sets, core and supplemental. Core indicators are classes of indicators that are informative of many aspects of range health and are useful for answering many other resource management questions. Core indicators are based on land health concepts they can be consistently measured in many ecosystems, they're scalable, and they apply to many different management objectives. Ideally, core indicators should be measured whenever you're collecting monitoring data, and importantly, they should always be measured in a consistent way. Examples of terrestrial core indicators for the Bureau of Land Management's Assessment Inventory and Monitoring Program are vegetation composition, cover and presence of plant species of management concern, cover and presence of invasive species, vegetation height, canopy gaps, and plant species diversity. And there are similar core indicators that have been developed for aquatic systems as well as lentic and riparian areas. Core indicators, however, are not sufficient to answer every management question. In this case, we can add supplemental indicators to help meet a local or a resource specific objective. Supplemental indicators may be related to a specific land use like utilization uh, measures for grazing management. They could be related to a resource concern like if we needed to measure density of plants in a restoration area. Or they may be applicable to only specific e ecosystems or circumstances. An example of this is measuring the depth of the active layer or the depth to permafrost in tundra systems. It's important to remember though that supplemental indicators are used in conjunction with core indicators. Indicators are characteristics of an ecosystem that can be measured or observed. But for any given indicator there may be many different ways of measuring it. A method, then, is a specific technique for measuring an indicator. In other words, 
The indicator defines what you want to measure, and the method describes how you're going to measure it. For each indicator, you must specify the method to go with it. Keep in mind, though, that there may be more than one appropriate method for measuring the indicator. For example, we can measure cover using point intercept methods, along continuous transects, or within plot frames. Also, some methods may be able to generate measures for multiple indicators. A good example of this is the line point intercept method, which records data that can be used to calculate numerous cover and species composition indicators. The example here illustrates the distinction between indicators and methods. The indicator of shrub cover can be measured with any vegetation cover method, including line point intercept, continuous line intercept, point frames, or ocular estimates. While each of these methods measures the indicator cover, they have differences in how they define that indicator, and this can lead to inconsistencies in the indicator measurements or even incompatibility of the data. So it's important when selecting with the methods that you understand how the method defines that characteristic being measured and how it's measuring that characteristic. For example, line point intercept and continuous line intercept are both measures of cover, but they use different definitions for what cover is. The line point intercept method uses foliar cover definition where only exposed plant area is included in the cover calculation. That's like example A here. Alternatively, the continuous line intercept method uses a total canopy cover definition, where any area within the perimeter of the plant count toward the cover calculation. That's like examples B and C. While in practice, the difference between these definitions of cover may be small, it's an important distinction that may make data from the two methods incompatible, even though they're technically both measures of cover. So what makes a good method? Like the criteria for selecting indicators, there are several desirable properties of methods for research and monitoring. These include being quantitative. A method should record direct measurements or observations of things on the site whenever possible, rather than estimating them being repeatable and efficient. Measurements should be repeatable within a stated margin of error and should be able to be collected at a minimal cost. Having a low potential for non-sampling error. Methods that minimize sources of error like inter-observer variability and perform consistently across a wide range of environment are generally good methods. They should be objective. The method should minimize the opportunity for observer bias to influence the results. They should be established and validated. Methods implemented for monitoring programs should be well documented and tested. Quality assurance and quality control procedures should be well defined. Be wary of creating new methods yourself or using methods that have not been well vetted. Methods should be implementable with minimal training. Ideally, methods should be able to be learned quickly and reliable data collected by people without extensive experience. Comprehensive training and calibration programs should accompany any method implemented in a monitoring program. Ideally, you should be able to use the method to calculate many indicators. The more indicators that you can derive from a method's data, the more value it can add as a core method. And finally, the use of methods in other monitoring programs. Methods that are already implemented in other, especially large-scale monitoring programs, should be prioritized. Finally, let's talk about documenting your methods and where and when you can make modifications to methods that you have. Documenting your methods in excruciating detail is critical. This includes a definition of what the indicators are, the specifics for how the methods are implemented, and your data quality control procedures. This step is often overlooked or poorly done, but consider that the repeatability of a study or the ability to detect change over time hinges on the ability to replicate the methods. Additionally, monitoring data sets from different times or places can only be compared or combined if the methods were well described and compatible. 
you can make limited adjustments to methods if you need to to fit local needs or conditions or to improve compatibility with another data set. However, changes can only be made that affect the precision of the indicator. Changes that would affect either the accuracy of the indicator or the definition of what's being measured cannot be made because they would compromise the ability of the data to be used or combined with other data sets. For example, we can change the number of transects at a monitoring location, the number of L, uh, line point intercept pin drops uh, along a transect, because these changes only affect the precision of our cover estimates. The more transects or pin drops we have, the more precise the estimates of plant cover would be. However, changing the lower size limit of what's considered a rock versus soil uh, effectively increases what we report as rock cover. In other words, this is a change that affects the definition of the indicator, so it's something that we can't do. In this module, we learned the following. First, ecosystem attributes are complex variables that represent the status of a suite of related ecological properties and processes that are essential to ecosystem function. Second, conceptual models document what we know or think we know about how ecosystems are structured and how they function. Conceptual models are very useful for figuring out what we need to monitor and how to interpret the changes we see in monitoring data. Third, indicators are measurable characteristics of an ecosystem that are related to an ecosystem attribute or process that's too difficult, inconvenient, or expensive to measure directly. The indicators are what you're measuring. Core indicators are applicable across many different ecosystems. They're informative to many different management objectives and consistent with large-scale standardized monitoring efforts. Core indicators are intended to be measured at all monitoring locations and used many times for many purposes. Supplemental indicators are specific to a land use or management question that is not addressed by the core indicators. Supplemental indicators should be added whenever necessary to meet local management information needs. And finally, a method is a technique for measuring an indicator. It's how you're measuring things. Because there may be, there may be more than one applicable method for any indicator, it's important to specify which methods you're going to use. Also, some methods may be able to generate multiple indicator measures.